are being paid back. And in this day and age, loans are being written off. People are not able to pay their loans. They're losing their credit. They, they're going out of, uh, they've, they've lost their credit card. $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 in, in credit card debt is being written off the bank's ledger. That money disappears. When people lose their homes and they're foreclosed, they, they thought they had you know, $200,000, $300,000 value in a house. And now it's foreclosed and the banks are selling them for $20,000 or something like that. What happened to the difference? That money goes out of existence, you see. So the, the economy does have a dual force at work, expansion of the money supply and contraction of the money supply. But I'm here to tell you that historically, over the long period of time, whenever you've given people the power to expand the money supply at will, money created out of nothing, the net result will always be that the money supply will expand in spite of that other contrary force. Why? It's because it's the only trick they know. All problems are solved by pumping more money into the economy. And so finally, it's all, all of the entire economy is based on that. And we'll talk about that in a minute in the next session. And that has a, that has a consequence that is more than money-based. It has a consequence involving the nature of society, the nature of our social contract with each other, our relationship to the government. It has to do with master and slave. It's not just money. It has to do with our freedom. So that's another element to it. So anyway, uh, the net effect of this is that the money supply will expand. It always has, historically. And with that, we have this thing called inflation. It appears that the you know, cost of goods is going up, but in reality, they're not. It's that the value of the dollar is going down. That means that everything that you have in the form of money, you've saved it, you've worked for it, is being eroded, or better yet, a better word, it's being stolen from you through this process of inflation, which is not accidental, it's not mysterious. Uh, they know exactly how it works. They have been doing it to you for your whole life. And for most of us, we've never even questioned it. We've never even thought much about it. So today, it takes a dollar to buy goods that in 1913, when the Federal Reserve System was created, cost three cents. The rest of that has been stolen from anyone who had money put aside in savings. Those who have no savings, of course, don't pay this. Uh, they just are living hand to mouth. But those who have worked as Alan Greenspan called them, the productive elements of society, and to put money aside for their old age or pass on to their children or whatever, they have been robbed blind by this process. Today, 90% of the purchasing power of that savings has been lost. Why? Because they, we have abandoned the gold and the silver standard in our money system, and we violated one of the world's most important natural laws of economics. We won't go into how it happened. I mentioned a moment ago about the nature of the Federal Reserve being a cartel. We won't talk about the Jekyll Island meeting. You probably know all about that. And if you missed any of that stuff, you can surely find it in my book. But I would like to just uh, review the highlights of that story. There are seven conclusions to come to, and then we'll close this first session. First of all, the Federal Reserve System is a cartel. Secondly, it has a monopoly, it's been given a monopoly by Congress to create the nation's money supply. Boy, what a coup d'etat that was. A private group got a monopoly to create the nation's money supply. And by the way, to create a money supply that is directly contrary to the Constitution. Congress itself cannot do that, and yet they delegated this authority to a private group to do that. Never been challenged by the Supreme Court. Three, government has no authority over it whatsoever. It appears that it does because the president appoints the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. But in reality, if you're a, a student of reality politics, you'll know that it's the Federal Reserve System that appoints the president. How do you think these guys get elected? Who puts up the money? Who buys the media coverage? Who makes the backroom deals to make sure they get the nomination? Who makes the selection? This doesn't come from the guy out in the street. It comes from the, the fellows with the most money in 
the back room. They select the president. Every president of which I'm aware, when they appoint a chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, they never heard of this guy before that. Where did they get his name? It didn't come out of their personal address book. Where did they get his name? It was handed to them by a committee, right? The committee that raised money for them, the, the banking committees, the little groups that you never read about or hear about, the ones that say, well, Mr. President, uh, this is a list that we would like you to uh, consider behind us. And if you don't, you're through. But uh, this is a list of uh, good candidates for the chairman of the Federal Reserve. We recommend that you choose from one of these. And every one of them come from the banking industry or are friendly to the banking industry. If they're from academia, like the Bernanke, they have been very friendly to the Federal Reserve System. They've been advocates of it. You never find anybody like me being on that list, I can assure you. <laughs> okay. Money is fiat, it has no backing, therefore it has no limit. There's no limit to the amount of money they can create. Banks collect interest on nothing. We have an expanding money supply, which represents a tax on us all. It's a hidden tax, but it's a tax just the same, one that most people don't consider to be a tax. And finally, we have this uh, facade of bailouts and stimulus packages and all of these things, which are none of the above. They are actually legalized plunder of the American people. <coughs> the consequences of all that in, in general is that government and personal debt has grown to enormous proportion that's now in a vertical climb. Taxes and inflation have critically wounded the middle class. If there's ever going to be any survival of the middle class, it's becoming very problematic now. Personal freedom is in retreat. That's the summary. But now let's take a look at the details. And I've listed a few things here which I'd like to read off to you. Today, the federal government owes over $12 trillion in debt. And that is increasing at the rate of $4 billion every day. This adds up to approximately $150,000 per family of four. That's the amount of money that has to be paid off in some way by every family of four, an amount equivalent to the purchasing power of today's dollars of $150,000, okay? Interest on this national debt is the government's largest single expense. It's greater than the cost of uh, national defense, all of our armies, Navy, Air Force, much greater than that. It's larger than the combined costs of the departments of agriculture, education, energy, housing, urban and develop, uh, urban development, the Department of Interior, the Department of Justice, the Department of Labor, the Department of State, Department of Transportation and Veterans Affairs, all put together. Interest on this debt is greater than that. This is paid, or will be paid, not by the government. It will be paid by us in some way. And we know what that way will be because we've already been over that. It will be paid through taxes, direct taxes, but more importantly, through indirect taxes called inflation. Now, none of this goes to pay for any of the uh, government services that we're used to uh, thinking that's where the money goes. We get government services for it, right? We have to build roads for us, they protect our nation, you know, all of those things. None of that. Nothing is produced by it. There are no roads, no buildings, no national defense, no welfare, no medical benefits. Not even any salaries are paid by it. It pays nothing but interest. Interest now consumes, interest on the national debt, now consumes over 40% of all revenue collected from personal income taxes. The federal taxes, including Social Security, now take almost half of our private incomes. State, county, and local taxes are on top of that, and inflation feeds on what's left over. 